I'm going to talk about the sort of big data stuff that I've been doing over the last 15 years or so, something like that. And um, I like the title social <coughs> physics. Social physics is a phrase that's about two centuries old. You know, uh, around 1800, uh, people <coughs> began to turn chemistry from alchemy into what we recognize today, and people were all, you know, thinking about electrodynamics and, you know, all, all this science was happening. And they tried to do science with people, like to get, you know, social science and politics and management, you know, to be a science, and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is twofold. One is there was no data. Uh, they just didn't have data about human behavior, and they didn't have the math because humans are complicated. But today, we have big data from cell phones, from credit cards, from cameras, from all sorts of things. So I actually do things where we instrument an entire town for a year. It's absolutely everything you can imagine as part of an experiment. So it, you, know, you can get paid for it and so forth. And of course, with machine learning, you just heard a little bit about that. Um, you can do things that you could never even dream of uh, only a decade ago. So that's what I'm going to talk about. To sort of begin with, I just want to sort of say a little bit about sort of the things that I'm involved with so you know that, you know, what you're hearing. Um, so that picture on the left there is a picture of what Davos looks like. You may have wondered what the world I can help. It's just a bunch of folks in, you know, a hotel room. I'm about halfway back on the right. But the thing that's interesting is that the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission is in there. The uh, vice president of the EU is there. The CEO of uh, Master Charge is in there. The chairman of Vodafone. They're just regular people, right? And they're walking around in the snow. Uh, but it gives you an interesting place to talk about problems, like what are you gonna do with all this data? What's the social responsibility? And what about privacy? And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, just to sort of tell you what sort of discussions are going on. Um, so uh, about 20 years ago, people started talking about um, uh, ubiquitous computing and computers would be everywhere. Um, and they were all talking about you know cameras in the walls and stuff like that. And I thought that was sort of crazy because if, if things were really getting small and low power, they weren't going to be in the walls. You don't redo the walls very often at all. They'd be on your body, right? And so what I did is I created a race of cyborgs, the first race of cyborgs. There they are, um, to be able to ask, what would this look like in the future? Uh, what would it be like when you had digital connections to supercomputers and sensors on your body? And of course, you have that today, right? They're called cell phones. And now we're beginning to get watches and things like that. And so we had head-mounted displays. The guy second from the, the right, left there is the one that was technical lead for Google Glass. Other people have been key in some of the smart watches and MP3 players and things like that. And we learned a lot of stuff by running around with, you know, uh, you know, 8086 boards <laughs> with motorcycle batteries. I'm no kidding, right? It was, it was just amazing stuff. Um, one of the things we learned is that nobody's going to wear stuff like this, right? And so I hooked up with a bunch of uh, fashion designers in Paris, including some very famous ones. And we tried to guess what the future would look like 20 years in the future. And I think it's interesting to see. So this is the 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 project that I started with them, I and we had fashion shows and all sorts of things. But if you look at the thing that the guy is holding, it looks like an iPhone 6, doesn't it? And you have to remember, this thing was drawn before the, any cell phones in the whole world. And most people at this time thought that was going to be impossible. And that thing up on the left looks you know, reasonably like Google Glass. And so this stuff has been cooking for a long time. The people who sponsored this research, incidentally, include Apple, Samsung, Motorola. So, so there's a sort of deep history in the, the wireless stuff we see today that you don't normally know about. But the real change um, that I saw was that wearables uh, were not primarily about information devices. They're not the same as your desktop or even your tablet. 
because they're with you all the time. They know where they are. It was clear you were going to begin using them for things like purchasing. Uh, they were going to have accelerometers and cameras, and all of that was clear. Um, and what that means is these are little sensor packages that you all carry around. Uh, and increasingly, they're having more. They're having health data that they're collecting, as well as financial data, as well as all sorts of other things. And what that does is it really uh, changes your understanding of both individuals and of companies and of communities, because now I can have dense data about people continuously for long periods of time. Now, that's really scary from a privacy point of view. From a, a science point of view, it's, it's a little bit like, um, you know, you died and gone to heaven because now using this sort of uh, human subjects uh, contracts and payments and frameworks that you do medical research with, you can begin understanding social research, social interactions in a way that was never possible before. And so, so it has that sort of two-pronged thing. And what we can now do is begin describing people's interactions. And I'll just say a word about the math because I want to cover what we do, not sort of what we do, uh, how we actually do it. So if you were describing people interacting for a long time, what you might do as a naive thing is you'd build a big master uh, Markov model. So everybody would be a finite state machine and they would interact with each other. But that scales really poorly. And the number of parameters in that are just crazy. So that you can't use machine learning to be able to characterize, say, an entire community along all these different axes for a year. But there's some very simple simplifications you can do. And in particular, you can, rather than having all the states of one person affect all the states of another person with no limitation, you can say, well, you know, you affect me a certain amount, and that happens, you know, the, the relationship has a certain strength across many, many states. And what that does is it makes the number of states that you're estimating go down to the log of the number of states in the master uh, HMM. But it preserves the behavior of the master thing. So this is uh, a general thing that's very interesting in machine learning. Machine learning takes a lot of data to be able to learn things. One of the reasons is it's stupid. It doesn't know anything about the thing that it's learning about. And what we're doing here is building in the fact that people are individual agents that have more or less fixed relationships <coughs> along several different dimensions. By building the structure of the human relationship in, it turns out the number of parameters drops precipitously. You can now begin to estimate things very quickly and very stably. And you can do things that are, are interesting. So um, I'm not going to go through this, but you can, can for instance, uh, like we've been able to look at Bitcoin transactions and, and discover fraudulent RINs, people that are doing Monday laundering, people that are doing other sorts of things. Not because of the machine learning being so good, but because there's a lot of stuff in there about how humans behave, and that humans are individuals, and that makes the machine learning aspect of it um, dramatically faster. Uh, and so we have one of our spin-off companies, I'll talk about our spin-off companies is, is doing that. Uh, <coughs> so um, let me talk to you about some of the other things that we've done in being able to analyze people using this sort of way of thinking. So one of the first things we discovered was that uh, when you look at people interacting, uh, you can generally predict what's going to come, the outcome of the interaction without knowing, without <coughs> listening to the words at all. So think about this for a minute. So if you see some people arguing, they could be arguing across the room. You can't hear the words. Maybe the words are a different language, but you can know that they're arguing. Or you can see a group that's really interested about something and know that they're interested <coughs> without knowing about the words. And what's going on there is that humans, before we had language, were still social species. And we had signals that we used to communicate dominance and interest and stuff like that. And those signals are very tightly tied to our biology. And they still exist. Now, in the research that people have done and the work people have done, 
people get fascinated by words. So almost all the research focuses on words. And the signaling stuff gets left to qualitative psychologists or self-help people or stuff like that. <coughs> but you can build signal processing things that pulls this out and does stuff with it. And I'll show you a couple of fun examples. Um, so for instance, looking at energy. So um, you have this very old part of your uh, nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And when you get interested in something or scared by something, you get nervous energy. It's fight or flight. And this happens to everybody. It happens to little kids. It happens to dogs. It happens to adults. We did, for instance, an experiment with semi-pro poker players, right? And we could beat them. We made money off the pro poker players by analyzing how active they were. Now, normally, what happens in poker is the newbie, the new guys come in, and when they get a good hand, they get excited and they bounce around a little bit and know they've got a good hand. Experts know that, so they try to suppress it. And so when you see an expert become really cold and quiet, that means they've got a good hand. They go to most the other way. Or dating, for instance, we went to a bar uh, where they're doing speed dating, you know, and if they talk for three minutes, and if they like each other in those three minutes, um, you know, they exchange uh, contact information and so forth. And without knowing anything about the people or what they said, we could tell who would exchange information. And it mostly had to do with the timing between them. So when their timing was really tight, so you would finish saying something and then the girl would jump in immediately and stuff like that, and you weren't interrupting each other, but you know, you were finishing each other's sentences, you've heard that phrase. You can measure that. And it turns out that things like that predict whether or not she's going to give you her phone number or <coughs> email or something like that. And then uh, another thing that was done uh, here by a friend at Stanford uh, has to do with mimicry. So I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but when people are talking uh, and one person begins, say, nodding their head, and the other people will begin nodding their head. If one person goes like this, other people do this. So automatic response that humans have to read each other. But what it is, it's an indication of trust and empathy. So he did an experiment where he had a computer agent that was trying to sell you something. And in one condition, it was using the camera. So in the camera condition, if you moved your head, the little computer agent would move its head too, about four seconds later. People don't detect that. They don't notice it. But that's 30% more successful at sales than just straight up selling. Because people feel that it's more of a trusted agent and so forth. So it's worth thinking about these things. And this is our examples of sort of like the conventional big data being used in things. And there are many different sorts of things um, where, where you can make use of this. So these are two spin-off companies. Um, one does mostly health work, so it works for Aetna, Humana, people like that. Um, and in those um, uh, companies, you have nurses who call up people with chronic diseases and try to talk them into taking their pills or exercising or stuff like that. And what do people say when the nurse calls you up and says, you should take your pills? What do they always say? They say, yes, sure, I'll take the pills. But most of the time, they're, they're just blowing you off, right? It turns out you can look at the timing and the prosody, and you can tell who's blowing you off and who's actually going to do it. And if you know that, you can then adapt the pitch you give to the person to get them to be more compliant with taking their medicine. Now, you make it one sort of cool. So Edna tells us that that saves them $20,000 per seat per month in deferred costs. So 20,000 bucks per seat per month is not bad, right? Or this one is a, another startup company uh, came out of my group, Ginger IO. Just as an experiment, how many people have heard about it? Okay, so Vinit Coastal is the one that leading the, the funding of this. And it's, it's sort of a check engine-like application. The idea is, that as you begin to get, this is another sort of signaling we come. As you begin to get sick, you signal that you're sick. 
And you can imagine this has a sort of evolutionary thing, right? It's like, we're all going to go out and, you know, hunt males or hunt, you know, saber-toothed tigers. And you want to be able to look at the other guy and know, this guy's sick. He's not going to be any help, right? <laughs> so we actually signal in our behavior how we're feeling. And you can read it <coughs> off of the signal or off of the cell phone. Not bad. Now, the quote up there is from the, the chief technical officer of the United States. Because here's the idea, is that if you're a health system, let's just pick Kaiser as an example, um, you have a few million people on your insurance rolls, right? Now, you, normal operation, what happens, you wait till they get really sick, and they drag themselves into the doctor and say, I'm dying, doctor, right? And at that point, they're very, they're very expensive, and it's hard to fix things. Now, what would happen if you had a sensor on them that was a getting sick sensor, like a chicken check engine light on your car, right? You could say, out of the couple million people, here's a few thousand that are acting like they're getting sick. <coughs> Let's give them a call before they get really sick and ask them, you know, a couple questions. And if they sound like they're still getting sick, you bring them in. Well, you save an incredible bundle of money. And it's not small. It's it's on the order. It goes up. Estimates go up to like 90% of the total medical cost. If you get people into the right at the right time with a little bit of diagnosis, it just changes the, the economics of the healthcare system dramatically. The 90 cents probably too high, but but it's huge. So that's another example of this signaling stuff. Now this is very different than what most people do with, um, <laughs> with big data and trying to analyze it. Like just before the talk here, people were asking me about oh parsing natural language and stuff like that. That's what everybody does, and um, it's really hard. People don't do it very well, and they're missing the other 50% of the data, at least in these live um, live interactions. So. Um, that's one type of big data analysis that we pioneered. Another type is looking at groups of people. So this is a sort of, how do you make your company work? How do you actually make your work group work? How do you actually work with your customers? Sorts of things. And, and if you take this mindset that people are like finite state machines and they give off signals and that's how they coordinate, and sort of forget all that stuff they taught you in college about cognitive science and deep representation and linguistics, right? Just imagine people are simple. You're probably more right than, than you can imagine. You begin to have a, a big data approach to understanding people that's very different than what most people do. Um, and it's sort of thinking about people like bees for the sort of, you know, when, when bees want to make a decision about where to move the hive to, they send out bees to explore, the bees come back, they do this waggle dance, and the one with the biggest <laughs> dance and attracts the most people, you know, then recruits more people to go out in his direction, and then they come back, and when you get a certain number of them all voting for the same direction, everybody in the hive picks up some moves. It turns out that pattern is pretty typical of people, too. With some variations. So I mean, forget all this stuff about strategy and stuff like that. It, it's a little simpler than, than you might think. So um, let me give you a couple of uh, examples. Um, so we did uh, an experiment where we dragged a few hundred uh, uh, people off of the streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we formed them into teams <coughs> and we had them solve a whole range of problems. And what we discovered was is that the IQ of the people, the personality of the people, all the traditional things you, you know about team formation mm -hmm. really weren't significant. What was significant was did they all get engaged? Were they all contributing equally? And did they all acknowledge lots of little contributions and acknowledging those contributions? So instead of a, a conversation where a few people dominate, it's one where people are much more <laughs> equal dominated. And that's really interesting because this is something you can do with signal processing 
very easily. You can build things that listen to Skype calls or things like that and do this without having to understand the language. Okay? Um, it turns out that this pattern of interaction accounts for 50% of the variance between low performing <coughs> groups and high performing groups. To give you a comparison, the personality variables account for about 5%, and IQ is less than that. So all that stuff that HR tells you, <laughs> you sort of know this already. You don't have to really listen to that. <laughs> but you do have to do things um, where everybody gets engaged. Interestingly, uh, when you get groups that have more sort of social <laughs> intelligence, so they're better at reading other people, the, those are groups that show this pattern. So you need to raise your social intelligence a little bit. And as it turns out, women are better than men at this. So when you get a few women in the group, the group does better. Okay? Just, just saying. <laughs> um, you can use the same sort of thing. This is an example of a, a spin-out company that we have. That, um, that you can use this to make distance uh, meetings better. <coughs> so, um, for instance, how many of you spend a good fraction of every single day uh, in a meeting with people in a different continent? Yeah, I mean, it's just everybody does this, right? And you can always hear the typing going on in the background. And it, it doesn't work, right? But we found a very simple mm -hmm. thing. Actually changes it dramatically, and that's having a little display like this. So here, two people are in one continent, and two people are in another continent. So the guys on the top are in one place, the guys on the bottom are in another place. And what the ball does is it shows how even the conversation is. So if everyone's contributing equally, the ball's in the middle. Yeah. And if everybody's interactive, that means lots of exchanges back and forth, and not one person carrying on, the ball's nice and green. If it's a normal conversation, like you probably have a good fraction of every day, it looks like this. There's one guy that's bloviating and carrying on, right? And nobody else talks, and, you know, it's, it's, and this is a low performing group. And what's interesting is just giving people this sort of display turns these low performing groups into high performing groups. It makes them statistically um, uh, indistinguishable from face to face groups, which is a tremendous sort of a change. So um, you can carry this a little bit further. So this is a, a, a spin off company called Sociometric Solutions, the last one and this one. Builds little badges little name badges that have lots of electronics in them. And what the electronics does is it doesn't record any words because people get really pissed off if you record words. It records where you are and if you had conversations and what your body language was. So it has accelerometer, it has little microphones and DSP and wireless, of course. And what you can do is you can begin to look at um, organizations. Like this, for instance, is part of a bank. It's the part of a bank that does advertising. Um, so they come up with mortgage plans and other sorts of things. And, you know, there's lots of groups. There's managers, development, sales, support, customer service. And the blue is the <coughs> pattern of email between these groups. And the red is the pattern of face-to-face -face communication between those groups. Could be telephone communication, too. It's not hard to do that. Um, and what you're seeing there is you're seeing the pattern of information moving around in the organization. And what is always amazing to me is, is that the most valuable thing in your organization is how the information moves around, right? Are people in the loop, right? Does the information get from A to B? And nobody keeps track of that at all, right? So, so here, for instance, each frame up here is one day worth of, of you know, living in, the, in this organization. Um, the, the big arcs are when people, like from sales, talk to people to support. Typically, it's not in meetings, because what happens in a meeting? You all get in this room, and one person talks at you, right? Or two people talk at you. So that's not a conversation. So the arcs here, the face-to-face -face stuff, is the stuff that happens in the hall. It's the stuff that happens around the coffee pot or over lunch, things like that. And it turns out that's what matters. So, for instance, in this organization, um, 
to see if we can do this. So I think they, usually there's a little timer down here. Let us, let me wait. So they're going to start a big ad campaign at the beginning of the month, just a second. And I think that's the beginning. So the managers send out lots of email. You get meetings between the different groups. But nobody talks to customer service the whole time. And so when they release this product, it's a disaster because customer service can't support it. And then they have all-day meetings with customers. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out, when we showed this to everybody, they said, oh, well, yeah, of course. Customer service isn't in the same spot. To get the customer service, they had to go down the hall, around the corner, through the door. They had a different coffee pot. They used a different lunch room. Of course, we never talked to them. And of course, when they tried to build products, it doesn't work. So they moved customer service in with other people. All of a sudden, things began to work a little bit. Okay. So um, what I've told you is that you can analyze people's behavior and look at the pattern of communication, or the, the how rather than the what, and learn a huge amount about it, about what's going on, and be able to use that to engineer you know, better organizations and stuff. I'll get to customers in a minute, which is what most people are interested in, you know, sales and advertising. But let me just say a word about um, social, digital social networks first. So, um, how many of you think that digital social networks are sort of, uh, well, I shouldn't bias at this point. <laughs> how, much, how many of you think that digital social networks are really, um, you know, a very good shape, they're really doing the things that we hoped for, <laughs> and so forth. Anybody? No. They're, they're sort of weird in some ways. Like you get these fads that go across them, and so like suddenly everybody's doing something, right? Or, you know, suddenly everybody believes X, whatever X is. It's sort of weird. It, so we wondered about that. We wondered how the digital social networks compare to face to face networks. And so I've made a partnership with a, a social network called eToro. You can't normally access it in this country. Uh, it has three million customers. It's not a very big thing, but it's really unusual because it's a trading network. So it's three million people that buy and sell stocks, gold, euro, stuff like that. And they, they do this on very short term. So you get millions, tens of millions of transactions a month. In fact, you often get like a million transactions a day, okay, of people betting their own money on different sort of movements. What's unusual is you can see what everybody else is doing. So if I'm part of eToro, what I can do is I can see what you're trading. I can't see how many dollars you put in, but I can see you're long on euros and short on the dollar, and I can see in the last three months you made a ton of money. And so what I can do is I can say, well, you know, I don't know about this stuff. He's doing really well, so I'm going to take 10% of my money and bet on him. Whatever he does, my money follows, okay? And so that's what people are doing. They're using each other like advisors based on their record. You know, a lot better than mutual funds. How many of you have mutual funds? Yeah, right. Are you happy with them? Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> they're terrible. Uh, but in eToro, you can see how they're doing, and you can see what they're doing, and you can see what all the other people are. So it's actually pretty interesting. But the question comes up is how well does this social network stuff work? So now I have this place where you can see how good the decisions are. This guy got to make money? That's good decisions. He loses money? Bad decisions. Okay? Some days everybody loses money. Some days everybody makes money. What, what, what determines the good, good decision? But it turns out that if you look at the density of the network on here, you can predict and you have to look at, at how strong the ties are, too. So it's not a trivial calculation. It has to do with the eigenvalues of the, the big you know, uh, connection matrix and stuff. Um, but if you look at that and you say, how tightly tied is this whole social network? That's the x-axis there. Okay? And so some days, you know, everybody has just decided to sort of go it alone. And they're just trading by themselves the way that most people always have. Other days, everyone's really tied together. Everybody's following each other. 
right? Everyone's like, you know, learning from each other and betting on each other and stuff. And some days, it's in between. And you can ask, which is best? And it turns out that if you look at the return on investment, you can tell. Now, each dot here is the return on investment for 3 million people, for a couple million people, for a day. So it's a lot of money and a lot of bets, okay? And it's over, of course, a couple years. And what you see is that trading money by yourself, stupid. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. Being somewhat social is great. And it turns out that the place that is the sweet spot is where you have the maximum different ideas <coughs> and different strategies that you follow. So when you have the most diverse strategies possible, you make 30% more money than the average person. This is good, right? And it's reliable across years and all sorts. I mean, it, you can really bet on this. And then as it gets more and more dense, the return on investment goes down. And what I'm not showing here is that sometimes people get wiped out if in this, this echo chamber thing. So when everybody's doing the same thing, sometimes the bet is wrong and everybody just gets wiped out. So there's a funny story, not so funny, a story about there's one guy in Latvia who was, had a long streak and people kept copying him and the people would copy the copiers and then one day the guy in Latvia made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And you know, hundreds of thousands of people got wiped out, right? Bad, <laughs> don't do that. But what's interesting here is, is you can actually measure sort of the strength of the social network and how much influence it has on people. And you can see the diversity of ideas in it. As it gets stronger and stronger, everybody is chasing the same ideas. This is what you experience when you look at a lot of social networks, is suddenly everybody's saying the same thing. That's a place where you're going to make stupid decisions, where the information is bad. When you see really broad range of, of opinions, that's probably good. Okay, that's the sort of baseline. You can read the papers, there's math, stuff like that. But I just want to point that out, is that, that uh, it's interesting to see. <coughs> that gets on to other things about making good decisions. So for instance, um, instead of being a digital social network, you can ask about things like Foursquare. Okay, and other sorts of check-in type things. We're looking at physical face-to-face -face meetings. And it turns out that if you look at a region and ask how connected is this region with other regions, so how diverse is its social connections, that if you can tell me that number, I can tell you how many startups they have, how many patents get filed, and what its GDP is. And I don't know exactly what's causal. But I do see that the people that have the most diverse connections are the ones that are doing the startups, making the patents, earning the money. So you might want to pay attention to that. Right? Um, it's sort of, in some ways, the, the story of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is connected to the rest of the world. Right? People, ideas from all over. Maybe not, maybe not as much as it ought to be. I think, actually, what Silicon Valley is today is a little bit like this, but you know, maybe <laughs> over here a little bit, right? <laughs> okay. Maybe you want to be back a little bit towards the middle. And so this is another thing that tells you, though, that this diversity of ideas that you get exposed to uh, helps things. And then there's other things, too. Like, for instance, we just won a, a big uh, contest that I had set up with uh, the city of London and, and tell it, O2. Carrier or two, uh, to try and predict crime. And it turns out you can do a great job of predicting crime using cell phone data, transportation data, um, and historical data. Uh, and it turns out the answer is, is that places where the mixtures of the, the diversity of different people changes, so in other words, all the old people start staying home, or all the young people show up, are places that are very likely to have crime in the future. So it's not about people, it's about places. And when the diversity changes, there's social stress, and that's places for crime. It's also places where the social workers ought to show up, things like that. 
Um, just in the interest of thing, again, you can read about that. <coughs> so let me tell you, um, I'm, I think I'm going to tell you two more things, if that's OK. Um, one is about how you change people's behavior, probably a big topic here in Silicon Valley. And the second one is about privacy and security, okay, which is what I'm really here to talk about tomorrow uh, for the 20th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Um, so social pressure. So how do you get people to work together? Well, the, the typical answer people give is one based on economics. Right? You give people incentives or punishment to change their behavior, right? And the model there that's implicit is, you know, that we're all individuals and make up our minds to do things and incentives will change us. Okay, so that's sort of the social science of 1780. And that's what we manage ourselves on, is that sort of thing. But what I just told you about is decision making, um, economic investment, all are very, very strongly <coughs> affected by peer-to-peer -peer relationships, not individual relationships. So for instance, you know, if you go back to that curve right, uh, with the investors, the, the echo chamber one, that's where economic bubbles come from. Everybody's listening to everybody else and doing the same thing. Stuff gets bid up way over the normal price that it should be at. And that's not in economics. But yet, that's what we use most of the time. And if you... Um, Think about the peer-to-peer -peer relationships as being possible, uh, being important. It turns out that you can write down equations that are just like normal sort of economic equations, but they include terms. So there's, you know, how much you make for a particular uh, decision, um, how much you cost other people when you know you're the one that uses the common resource. You can put in a term that has to do with peer pressure. So. You know, if I don't like what you're doing, I'm going to give you grief. That costs me a little bit, and it costs you a little bit, too. So you can put that in the equation, um, so the cost and the pressure. And then if I want to change behavior, I can put in an incentive. And you can put in incentives lots of places. What we usually do is give incentives to individuals. But I can also give incentives to relationships. So I can incent our relationship to change in a particular way. And it turns out that generically that's twice as good as economic incentives. So let me just sort of explain what that means. That means almost all the time it will be at least half the cost, twice as effective, you can pick which way you say it, as what you do. Okay? So you say, well, gee, so if I could save half the money or get twice the bang for my buck, that ought to be pretty good. What are you talking about? OK, well, let me show you a little bit about what we're talking about. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So I gave um, smartphones to everybody in a small community of young uh, families. So these are not very wealthy people. Um, so this is a big incentive for them to let us snoop on them, basically. <laughs> right, you know, we have a big experiment. We're going to do an experiment. You get a smartphone, you get some money. OK, great. Um, and what on those smartphones had is they had um, um, pedometers. So you can see how active you were. Just a little software, right? And if somebody was more active than they were the previous week, then they would make some money. Not a lot of money, like three bucks, four bucks, that sort of thing. So that was half the community. Another part of the community, I did something different. If I wanted to change your behavior, I take the two people you interact with most, and I let them. I call them your buddies. I say these two gentlemen, <coughs> and they can see what you do. And if you're more active than last week, they get a reward. <laughs> Not you, sorry. Okay, <laughs> just that. And but you're okay because you're her buddy. Okay, and if she's more active, then you get a reward. So everybody's in the game. Okay. But you're not in the game for you. You're in the game for your buddy. Okay, so which one do you think worked best? Uh, I wouldn't tell you this unless I was told for you something that worked, right? Um, it turns out that that can be, in this experiment, up to eight times more effective than giving people direct incentives. 
So this is a little bit like you know 12-step programs and things like that, except that it's digital and and it's you know big data. You're watching people. You're giving them real-time rewards based on analysis of the data. And what you're doing is incenting social relationships rather than individuals. The other thing about this is that after we ran out of money, which happened in about three months, the ones that we're giving money to directly reverted to their old behavior and stopped being active. The people where we had given it to the buddies kept being active for as long as we could measure it. So it stopped. Now, you might want to just sort of think about what that might do with your company and with your uh, customers. Let me give you another example. We worked with a power company in Switzerland. Um, they're a hydropower. So up to a certain level, um, they're all green and happy and cheap. Beyond that, they have to fire up diesel generators. And it's dirty and expensive. And they tried everything to get people to stay at in the hydro regime, right? So they've given them discounts. They've, you know, giving them information, nothing really worked. And we talked them into trying out this buddy thing. So people signed up with their buddies. And if you saved energy, your buddies got a reward. Now the reward was really stupid. The reward was these little dancing bears that are like the state animal. And, and they're worth like a dime each, right? And, and in the power company store. So it's not like you can even buy anything terribly interesting with it. But, for 50 cents a week, on average, we got the population that signed up to save 17% energy over the normal behavior. 17% is huge. If, if you wanted to do that by economic incentives alone, you would have to double the price of the energy. And we were doing it for 50 cents a week. Pretty good. Yes? How do you, how do you Ensure that it was the only factor that was affecting them. Controlled this group. That it was well, we had there. balanced groups. You can't know that it was the only factor, but you know, nothing else was going on. And we had control groups, so we knew what was happening in the control groups. <coughs> it was an intervention. The guys with the intervention had very different behaviors. So let me give you one more example that's pretty interesting. Um, this is not done by me. This is actually done on Facebook with a friend of mine at UC, uh, UCLA. Um, and in the 2010 election, he s got them to send out 61 million get out and vote messages. Um, and he had a way of tracking whether people voted because of the message or not. I don't remember that. Um, the conversion rate for get out the vote messages was very low. Um, I think it was on the order of one in 10,000 people actually was motivated to vote because of the message. But if you did vote and you pressed the little I voted button, then your face showed up to all your Facebook friends. And you can ask, did that get people to vote? And the answer was, it was much better than the original message, but the conversion rate was still under a percent, okay? except in one group, and that was the people that had the closest relationships. So people who had appeared in Flickr photos with the other people had two to three hundred percent more conversion to voting. So just like in these other things that I told you about, it's the pressure from close relationships, peer pressure from close relationships that's effective. If I had signed up buddies, that didn't know each other real well, it doesn't work. If I had signed up buddies in Switzerland that didn't really know each other, I would have done that. Same thing here. Yeah? Is there like any follow-up study like to see what effect these experiments have on the relationships between these people? <laughs> in, the, uh, in the case of the activity, uh, yeah, we did follow up with that. And what ended up happening was the relationships were rated as higher, more close, and more trusted, because they'd done something together that was deemed by the, all the parties to be a good thing. So it actually raised the social capital, not a huge amount, but, but you know, noticeably, statistically significantly in the community. Let me just show you one more thing here. Um, 
So we've done this a couple of different places. Um, Rosa's, one of the first things we did was use these types of techniques to drive app adoption. <coughs> um, so it turns out that if you take social networks um, of various sorts, so um, you have proximity networks, so in other words, how much time do you spend with people? We have call networks, do you call them? Location networks, do you go to the same places? And then things like Facebook, back on, back on Facebook. And using that, we've been able to do really good jobs of predicting which apps people will download next. And it's a function of the people that you spend time with and the people that you talk to. But it's not a function of your online place. Sort of interesting. And we've done this with some companies. So for instance, for Telefonica, we got a five-time improvement in the return for previous premium services, basically video services. And for uh, Telenor, we were able to get a times 13 increase in sales for their data plans in uh, Southeast Asian country using these same types of techniques. So this is not a trivial effect. You can actually make stuff rock and roll with it. Okay? Um, and in none of these cases do the online networks do much. Okay, so um, I see I have about 15 minutes, a little less. Um, and I'm going to talk about the thing that you should be thinking about, which is, um, okay, so I can tell all this data about you, and I can change your behavior. Should I be scared? And the answer is yes, you should be scared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is not a great world. Um, so about six years ago now, almost seven years ago, I started up, I became very concerned about this and started a conversation group at Davos World Economic Forum among you know, the, the chairman and CEOs of many of the major banks and telcos and online things, as well as the, some of the chief regulators from the US, <coughs> from Europe, also from China, interesting, which is India. Um, and the suggestion was is that the only way to make this sort of brave new world a little bit more fair um, to move it from a world where companies or government own data about you, but you don't even know what's going on, and you certainly don't own your own data. Right, that's sort of like digital serfdom. Um, to move it to something that's more like digital democracy, what you had to do is you had to give people, at minimum, the rights of controlling data that's about them at some level. They had to know what's there. They had to be able to cut a deal. So I'll give you my data, but only if you give me a deal back, and I can shut the, the knob off any time I want if I don't like the, your performance on it. Right? So a little bit like a mutual fund, hopefully a better performing than a mutual fund, um, where you, know, you have data that is about you, where you go, what you buy, things like that. And in, sense, in essence, you give a license to companies to use that data for whatever purposes. They have to sort of cut you in in some way, by the service, you know, kickback, whatever. Um, but that was the, the um, kind of like opt-in for your different cell phone apps. Except a real opt-in, mm -hmm. where you could say, this data and not that data, and I don't like it, so just get rid of all my records. Okay. Right? Um, except, I mean, there's some little asterisks there. Like, Aggregate data doesn't belong to the individual. Okay, but basically it's involving the individual in the discussion. So, so actually apps are an example of it being done wrong because you really don't have any say in your app. It's either you use the app or not, right? If you use the app, you have to agree to all this arbitrary stuff that has no real motivation. And so, so what's come out of this is, is the Data protection, protection Acts in the EU and the uh, Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights here in this country. And the regulators are moving on this. Um, so if you're in the business of selling data about people, you might want to think about other places to be in business because mm -hmm. it's not clear how long that's going to last. Um, on the other hand, what these sort of regulations are doing is they're giving you really a hunting license to get very personal data, but you have to involve the customer, and you have to get their informed consent. 
I can talk more about that if you want. But I'll show you some examples. So there's a bunch of things that are best practice that are suggested that you might want to look into. One is, is that there are some, so this year, was it, half a billion identities have been stolen already, right? That's good, <laughs> or really horrible, depending on your side. Um, but there are some networks that seemingly are never hacked. And they're, they're odd. Like, for instance, how many of you know what the SWIFT network is? Yeah. $3 trillion a day. Now, if I were a bad guy, that's the network I would go after. I mean, forget all this other stuff. It's $3 trillion a day. If you could hack that for one second, you know, you could buy a Hawaiian island. Right? I mean, just, but as far as we know, it's never been hacked. So similarly, not your visa card, but the interbank visa transfers, so how the banks you know, deal with all the profit they make off of you, um, that has apparently has very low or no hacking also. And one of the things that's distinguishing is that they have a very patterned pa uh, 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 communication structure. So they give minimal information. It's in a very fixed format. Uh, but the thing that really is the kicker is it's got a legal aspect. There is a contract which matches the code exactly so that when I send you a message, that's a legal offer for a particular thing, and when you acknowledge it correctly, you just signed the contract. And now there's joint liability. If I screw up, you lose two. I lose, maybe he loses two in some cases. So everybody's watching each other to make sure that this works okay. So, you know, when we think about privacy, when we think about security, we think about purely sort of computer methods for doing it, but there's this other big tool out there, which is contract law, which doesn't have to be big and scary. I mean, in fact, I have a couple of team lawyers on my team, and you know, they help us do stuff, and they're perfectly nice people. Um, and we've put together a system which is, we think of as a reference system uh, for doing this. It doesn't mean it's the best in the world, but it's open source. It's supported by, uh, as a proto standard, by the Kerberos uh, Consortium, which does the basic security infrastructure for the internet. Um, and I helped talk uh, the US military into partying with their um, authentication mechanisms. So something called OpenID Connect, um, which is a way, you can think of it as a way to get rid of passwords. Uh, and it's a sort of state-of-the-art way of, um, of authenticating people for follow-on services. It's sort of two generations on after OAuth and things like that. Um, and um, it's got a couple of other things that mimic the Swift network. One of the things is, is that it has a secure um, computation area. So instead of sharing data with people, you share answers. So you share the minimal thing that you need for service. So unlike the apps where they say, and you agree to share all your call records and all your GPA, it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, I'll tell you when I'm in San Francisco <coughs> if you're giving me something that has to do with San Francisco. But that's it, right? You just get that one bit. Um, so it has, it, it keeps the computation on your side, not on their side. So the raw data goes out as little as possible. And there are ways of doing security off of that. Um, for instance, it includes both in the contract and in the code auditability. And the other thing it includes is, um, I already said that, is uh, it's distributed. Um, so, you know, this is sort of something that's an evolution. But I think it's interesting to reflect on what happened um, with the NSA and, and the Snowden affair. So interestingly, Ashton Carter, who's the Deputy Secretary of Defense and in charge of a lot of this, uh, said that they had made two mistakes with the Snowden affair. Uh, one, the smaller one, was giving Snowden access to all that data. That's really it. So what's the big one? Well, the big one is putting all that data in one spot to begin with, right? Because the moment you stick it in one spot, you know where to go get it. And, and you want to ask yourself, how many people did just what Snowden did, but they didn't tell you about it? They just sold it to somebody. 
I would be willing to bet that it's the, the number is, is considerably more than one. Okay? But you're never going to hear about it. Okay? So, so these systems should be distributed. And so as you design things for your companies, don't stick everything in one spot. Keep the data in places where it's collected and where there's people that know about the data so that you can have different eyeballs watching <coughs> for um, things that are unusual. Think of it like building a spy network. You would never build a spy network where everybody knew each other <coughs> and they all lived in one building. That would be stupid, right? <laughs> but that's what we do with our data. Sir? I hear what you're saying, but the government, there may be good things going forward that are happening, but our government isn't becoming less centralized. The world financial system isn't becoming more distributed. There are 500 companies that own 70% of the world's wealth and trade and own to each other. So this is aspirational. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but because look, you know, if you had gone to any one of these guys, you know, two years ago, or if you do it today, and you say, what's best practice? You know what they tell you? They tell you you set up an air gap around your database that has everything in it. It's like, how stupid is that? I mean, we know, we've known for a long time that it doesn't work, and yet they're still doing it. And so what I'm saying is, look, we ought to sort of give them a clue that that's not a great strategy, right? And, and just think that it's interesting that after this affair, you know, the head guy came out and said, oh gosh, sticking it in one spot was a mistake. I'm sure they're still going to do more of it, you know, because a lot of momentum and stuff like that. Okay. Back there, yeah. Um, so how do you gain insights that you can only get by correlating data if you keep it separated like that? You have to ask. Right? I mean, so uh, you can get data from lots of different places pretty easily if you know what you're asking for. Now, can you search for random things? It's harder. Okay? Well, everybody's harder, too. Not it's not that person. hard. I mean, once you know, once you have things indexed correctly, I mean, it, it's not that much slower to get a distributed <coughs> system, to work with a distributed system than to have a centralized system. But some of it has to know the full picture. Um, no. Nobody knows the whole picture most of the time. I mean, if you actually go and talk to people about their computer, si their computer systems or their security systems, I mean, we, we do that. Nobody knows. Absolutely nobody has a clue. Really. It's bad. It just really is that way. I don't know. They have a general idea. Often the general idea turns out to be wrong. I mean, we do things like we did for Aramco, right? We tried to look at their computer system. Turned out, not only did they not know, but it was doing things that they were horrified by. We looked at a major a car <coughs> manufacturer, again, who thought they knew what their computer said. No, no, they really didn't know, and they didn't know where the bottlenecks were, and they didn't, there were lots of things that they didn't know. Uh, that's not, that's a whole different issue. But it actually, you know, you can build distributed systems that are um, nearly as efficient or as efficient as the centralized systems nowadays. And it's safer in various <coughs> ways. That's what I'm arguing. Yeah, think about it. You may not like that. So I mean, yeah. You're talking about a different architecture. Uh, it strikes me that the biggest, most successful applications of the web, things like Google, were based on a centralized architecture. And you're talking about moving the data out to a distributed model at the edges where the users are. Okay. What made the web take off was this killer app, web browsing. What's the killer app that you can't build without a distributed architecture? I mean, to, to, if this, this aspirational model of yours is ever going to take hold, there has to be a killer app that will drive it, is my theory, something that, that, that becomes possible well, because the, of it, that wasn't possible So, so there's it. two things that, that, that I imagine, okay? Um, I'll be right. Uh, one is, it's cheaper to do a distributed thing, because often the data you collect comes from different places, and so you need to have a, a cop, like for instance, if you're going to combine um, credit card data and mobility data, 
Those come through different systems. They're naturally in different places just as they're birthed, right? And so the question of then copying them to a centralized place is an added expense. Now, there's other expenses of keeping them distributed, but, but that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Right, is, is that it's actually sort of nice to keep them. Uh, it's a little simpler to keep them that way and just provide access. The second thing is that um, if you look at security concerns, if you put it all in one place, you lose the whole thing if somebody breaks in. Right? I mean, you lose everything. If you have a distributed thing like that, it becomes very, very hard to get everything. You can get these ones, or you can get those ones, but you can't get them all together. And so if you really think about um, you know, cybersecurity as a war, an ongoing war, you sort of ask yourself, well, how would you plan a war? Would you take all of your resources and stick them in one battle? That would be a stupid way to do it, because if you lose that battle, you're out, OK? What you'd like to do is you'd like to distribute them and attack when you have better advantage. And, you will lose some. That's the thing that's different. You said, yep, we're going to have attrition. We're going to learn from that. We're going to go on. But we have to make sure we don't lose the whole kit and caboodle. And that's the, the big change. So I think that when people see that a distributed system gives them limited damage, risk control, when the, particularly when the financial guys see that they can limit their downside risk by having distributed systems, then it may become much more attractive. And I was really fishing for some kind of a end user application, something that would drive adoption of this this new medium. Uh, Medical telemetry, good luck. Well, I, I would say your point is not to build a killer app, you're trying to prevent that somebody builds a killer app. <laughs> All right. So, so actually, actually, one of the places that we've seen um, the most interest and in uptake of this idea is in um, places where you really don't want the government to know things, mm -hmm. right? So you can imagine certain places that are not main Europe or U.S. where, you know, it's, it, it means your life not to have the government know everything all of the time. And uh, in places like that, Everybody is engaged in a certain war. I mean, I, you know, not to, to pick up. I lived one time in a, uh, one of the bricks, and um, you know, if you looked at the transactions, nobody in their right mind would like, for instance, buy a house for the listed price. I mean, you, you, you hid the money because there were all sorts of people that would come after you if they knew how much money there was in any one transaction. You'd do yeah. 10 different things. They were indirect, so that they could come after one or two, but they couldn't get them all, right? And, and that was just a habit, because too many times the bad guys came and took things, and they just sort of learned. You never make it all visible. Uh, and so, well, perhaps that will be the, the killer app. But Let me just, yeah, OK. So uh, have you studied some uh, possible criteria by which to distribute data? Uh, like, do you think there is a way to decide how the data should be distributed so, so as to secure it. Uh, or because there could be some applications where distributing it could actually lead to uh, challenges of its own in terms of using the data. Sure. Um, typically not, because there are external things that drive that, like for instance, where the data is generated from. Um, I was talking to the uh, uh, the Secretary of State of Kansas, and he pointed out that in Kansas, you know, most people have shotguns, and they don't want the government coming around. And so in Kansas, they want their data in their house, because then it's constitutionally protected. Okay, and they have a shotgun. Okay. <laughs> shotgun protected. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a different attitude. I'm not going to say anything about it, but you know, so that's one way of doing it. If you go to Estonia or you go to some of the other places, there are different reasons to protect your data in different ways. So uh, do, you, do you foresee that uh, data could become wearable like devices are? Um, what can I say? Um, yes, um, but in an odd way. So I, I can't tell you about the technology. Uh, but 
Um, people. Already, something is being built in that regard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so there are people who um, used to work for the the most secure agencies that are building stuff, where your passwords, your encryption mechanisms, things like that, are in a physically controlled space, which might be in your house, for instance. But what you're given is you're given it's called a trust anchor. Okay, this is a, is a secure hardware that um, generates um, passwords, hashes, things like that, based on your private knowledge. And you just insert it in devices, and the devices will only work for you as you if you have this little bit of hardware in there. And so, so um, that's pretty interesting to start thinking about that. Um, and it's driven by, partially by the um, fact that you cannot build large secure systems because the largest uh, operating system or largest sort of system that's known to be is provably correct is about 4,000 lines of code. Okay, so that's what you're limited to. And, and if you're using hardware, the hardware had better be built under very special conditions where you know you can control what went into it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so people are trying to, to do that. Yeah. Um, so what we do with this, and then I'll finish up because I know everybody has to go. I have to go home because I'm on uh, East Coast time. Um, so we actually have de built the system and deployed it in various places uh, as a test bed. So for instance, this is something that is in Trento uh, in Italy, it's an autonomous region in, in Italy where we recruited with the help of Telefonica and Telecom Italia, young families and elders. Um, to look at what happens when they have secure uh, data collection and data sharing mechanisms. And uh, the idea here is to change the risk reward ratio for sharing. And the question is, is do people believe it? Do they use it? Is this good? Is it bad? Pain in the butt? Um, let me just skip that one. So uh, this is an example of the type of thing where it collects um, you get a personal data store that uh, records your mobility, call records, physical activity, things like that, credit card data. And you can control sharing of that in versus. So you can examine it. So like you can look at your work-life balance and stuff like that. Okay, that's sort of cute. But you can also share it anonymously with other people. Um, we did a version of that in this country with soldiers that were coming back from Afghanistan. Um, and what we did is recorded things that were indicative of PTSD or depression. And so they could get a reading of how they were doing, but they could share their data anonymously with other people that had come, just come back to see how they were doing relative to their other mates. And that was extremely successful. People, almost all of the soldiers shared their data anonymously because they had a secure mechanism for doing it. You have to understand that sharing mental health data is not something people do almost ever. And particularly, you don't do it in the military because it's going to be a career. If anybody gets wind that something is, is not correct. Um, so that was, that was quite something. But the young people in young families in, in Italy, we saw other things. For instance, uh, the young families would share um, locations of their children. How many of you post your kids' location on the web? <laughs> and, uh, talk about a brain dead stupid thing to do, right? But these people would do it. They'd say, my kids are going to be here at this time because they knew that it would only go to certain people that they had certified and could not be reshared. And they could audit that. And what that did is it solved a lot of problems, which is it's Saturday, you would like to talk to another adult, your kid wants to go to the you know, the kitty museum or something like that, and how do you hook up, right, with some other adults that had young kids. And so people were very avid about this. Again, in the high 90% shared data about their kids, of the young families. Or, or here's another one. Um, do other people spend as much on cars as you do? Have you ever wondered that? How about clothes? Do other people spend as much on clothes as you do? How about alcohol, trips, 
you don't even know how to ask those questions in American culture, right? But these people, these Italians, were able to do that. They were able to, you know, take an interface like that to Mint and then share um, anonymous data with people. And again, very high percentage of the people were willing to share their data when it was uh, something that they believed was secure. Was secure. Um, so people are willing to do things um, and enjoy it. In fact, you know, they, they got all over us you know, when we tried to take some of these services away because we ran out of money because they had gotten reliant on them. You know? What am I going to do with my kids on weekends? You know, you got to leave for the, you know, that sort of thing. So, so this idea of building these personal data stores that have the data about you and very uh, secure mechanisms of sharing, I think, is is a good one and it has a future. And we're doing additional things like that with one of the major hospitals, uh, which has the potential to really, I think, revolutionize uh, health data. So your personal health, your personal behavior can actually be something that's part of your medical record and so forth, which today is very hard. Uh, we're doing that at MIT to be able to manage the campus better and so forth. So that's it. Um, most of this you can find, I have a book that came out this year, uh, it's 14 bucks or something like that on Amazon. Um, so, so somebody here had their hand up first. Here. So were the Italian people who have to get back their devices uh, to develop their own tools to solve their problems? Um, no. Um, so Trento, we have the local university and students who are doing most of the developing of stuff. And the people that are using it are mostly <coughs> not people who are very computer literate at all. Right? They're just regular people who happen to have babies. Yeah. Um, I was curious when you, sh the first few slides that you showed, where we had the Google Glass and the iPhone, that was pretty amazing. But like, how, what took so long for these companies if that was, you know, being researched in 1995, like to, uh, you know, release it now, like the, the last few years? And I have one more question, uh, which is more regarding your personal, like, uh, you know, the stuff that you've been doing. Like, how do you? come across these ideas like when you understand the, uh, the computer science and how do you come across like how do you apply and get the solution for like hospitals or different like the healthcare apps you were showing how do you how do you connect those two things well so the, the, it turns out that the most uh, the biggest barrier for wearables is usually batteries uh, because until just very recently you couldn't make dense enough energy uh, storage devices that you could have no wireless. You should have wireless connections. You had to have wires. Wires make it just a pain in the butt. So um, when the batteries got good enough and some of like things like Bluetooth got low enough power, then you could do it. And in terms of actually, you know, inventing things, you have to ask, you know, where are the real problems in the world? And are there places where the data that already exists could be used um, as a proxy to be able to understand the situation better. And so those are the two questions, right? I mean, you know, mental health is a problem. Is there ways to understand uh, mental health? Well, if you look through the diagnostic criteria, it's all these things about your behavior. Where can I see your behavior? Well, your cell phone's a good place to see it. So is your credit card. A couple of other things like that that are pretty good for understanding your behavior. And if you look at that, it turns out you can do a pretty good job of understanding your mental health. So, back then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so since 9-11, uh, already been told that the government uh, go to the carrier to split the communication, everything, mm -hmm. uh, that the, uh, the data center from AT&T, yep. more than every single one. And with the uh, peer packet inspection technology, Well, look, look, um, 
you can make up all the bad stories you want and you know move to East or Island if you want. I would prefer to fight it. Um, and uh, maybe you know one has to be realistic. You only have to get so far in fighting this stuff. And and the way you fight it is not by being angry and writing screams against it because they're going to ignore you. They don't care what you think. What you have to do is you have to come up with ways where it's better for them to do it in a privacy way um, than uh, what they do today. For instance, it turns out that the NSA and the Department of Homeland Security have absolutely opposite requirements. So the Department of Homeland Security wants the US to be robust against attack, okay? So they would dearly love to have distributed systems with high levels of security. They would love your personal data to be stored in, a, in lots of local personal stores and heavily encrypted. That would make their job really easier, okay? And the NSA would hate that. But, okay, so now we know what we're gonna try and do, okay? <laughs> we got these natural sort of power groups and we can sort of push a little bit over here and maybe the balance will be somewhere in the middle. Sure. Well, what's going to make the guy at the NSA realize that the problem was the NSA had all that information? That's a question. <coughs> well, his boss got out in public and said it. That's a start. Mm -hmm. And then if the Homeland Security guy says, what I just said to you, how many Snowdens do you think there were? Mm -hmm. Right? That just didn't tell you. You know, maybe the gears will start turning in some people's heads. I mean, this is not an easy task, right? But, but that's the sort of thing you have to tell them, is things why it's in their interest to do it differently. And if we make the, the technology biased in a way that supports, for instance, very easy distributed things, then some cost cutter is going to look at it and say, why are you building that thing? You can just get the data when you need it. Okay? That's pretty good. Also, you not you ought to think um, not just about the US. I mean, you really want to think about, uh, you know, what is this technology going to be like in the next Syria? You know, where, I mean, you may not like the NSA, but they never didn't kill anybody in the US that I'm aware of anyhow. Um, on the other hand, that's not true in many countries. There are people who are genuinely bad, and yet they're going to have a lot more data in the future. How are we going to build, we ought to build systems that make it hard for them to do bad things. It's not going to be impossible, uh, but, but, you know, the, I don't know if I should say this, I will say it, I'll always say it, I got in trouble. You know, so, so the, the baseline is, for these bad guys, is you send to somebody to the house with a gun and you shoot the guy, okay? That's expensive, okay? They sometimes shoot back, you gotta have a lot of guys, bullets are expensive. So we have to make it so that that's the cheapest thing that they can do, okay? So our systems should make it, should not make their oppression easier than it is today. That's our goal. I don't know that we can do it, but we ought to try, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm on this little committee um, for the UN Secretary General, and it's called the Data Revolution for Sustainable Development, which is sort of cute. Because, um, you know, so you show up at the United Nations and they say, what do you do? Well, I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> but but here's, here's the, the, the motivation for that is that in most places in the world, we don't know how many babies are dying. We don't know when genocide happens. We don't know when people are starving to death until months later on. So having that data could really revolutionize systems for 5 billion people, 4 billion people, something like that. Um, and could bring a lot more transparency and accountability into governments for what? Our government's not that bad off. It's not great, but it's not that bad off. Um, the problem is, is that building that sort of transparency and accountability into a state that is uh, an oppressive state 
is a little dangerous. And uh, what we should think about how to design systems that make it hard to use in those ways. I mean, I think the world is headed that way. Everybody has a cell phone. Digital cash is good because it gets rid of a lot of corruption opportunities, blah, 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 blah. But it's got this other side to it, too. And the people in this room are the sort of people that are going to build systems that make it more safe than it might otherwise be. Way in the back there. A lot of these Yeah. So, so we just launched a consortium of uh, Bitcoin, altcoin, cryptocurrencies, and, stuff, um, and the U.S. Treasury <laughs> to, to have a discussion. Because the Treasury is demanding that they have know your customer <coughs> as part of banking oh, yeah. <laughs> and AML, anti-money lender. Okay? Um, that's a little difficult with the current <laughs> system. And... Um, so, so what's going to happen, first of all, is the discussion to try and come to some new way of thinking about it. My bet on it is, is that rather than having complete uh, pseudonymity and having completely distributed ledgers, what you're going to end up with is partially distributed ledgers uh, that are auditable. And instead of having full pseudonymity, you're going to have pseudonymity that can be broken uh, under some circumstances, okay? Because, you know, the, the guns, all that, right? You know, <coughs> somebody's got guns too, right? They're gonna, they're gonna come and shut things down unless, you know, you can show that the bad guys can't use this as their primary device or that it's hard for the bad guys to use it. And so um, it's a wonderful thing a wonderful bit of technology has got some problems uh, operationally. But I think in terms of um, what happens after a crime or preventing a crime, it's got some more to go. I mean, it's designed to be a radical libertarian platform. Okay? And that's wonderful, but most governments won't tolerate it. And so you're going to have a big battle. And likely what you'll end up with is something that's mostly distributed. And that <laughs> distributed might be the answer to some of these other things, right? Um, but, you know, if I had to say sort of where is the most interesting action in big data today, it's around this distributed centralized question and around digital identity. Those are the two big topics. How do you know this person? Under what conditions? Who certifies it? Is it a government? Is it a company? Um, and then how distributed is it and how hard is it to attack under different circumstances, including by a court? And, and we don't know the answers to that. Right? Yeah. Well, why don't we do like two more questions and then I've got to go back. How, uh, so I, I liked your idea in, in theory about like limiting the data that you send out to the companies, mm -hmm. but the way applications are developed right these days, it's like you send all your data and it goes to the cloud. It doesn't stay in your house. It's, everything is on the cloud. And then uh, companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, then, then, they, uh, then okay, they sell so, it to so advertisers. So you will, you will see in the not too distant future, um, companies, I, I can't tell you which companies, but, but large companies that move bits around offering trusted versions of these apps that don't do that. And you will pay a little bit of money not to have your data strewn all over the world. I don't, I don't want ads because with more data I feel there's going to be more ads on my face. No, I'm saying that you won't have any ads at all. Okay. Your data will go exactly where you want but you have to pay a little fee for that. So there's going to be a mirror of the current app store, but it's going to be a trusted app store that's certified to be safe for your data, okay? Okay. And I think people will begin moving that direction, and that's one thing, okay? That'd be really It'd be interesting. It'd be interesting, yeah. Um, and what was the other question? Um, it, it was like, um, like right now the model is like, 
they like you saying like the application permission you know or or the OAuth like it takes all your data but like uh, oh, the how cloud, do you the cloud thing. Uh, yeah so um, we for instance just uh, signed a deal with Luxembourg so what is Luxembourg Luxembourg is really interesting there are a number of countries like that the number of people you have to talk to in Luxembourg to get a new law you can count on your fingers and toes this is small country, right? <coughs> now, imagine that there was a country in the middle of Europe where the cloud really was secure and it really was your data. Would you use that one or would you use the other one where it's not really your data? Hmm. The Luxembourgians would like to use, to use things in their country and they tax a little bit of that, right? So you get regulatory comp competition. And there's other little countries that are trying to do that too. So you're going to see the current broken state of affairs changing. Okay? So we like to joke that you're going to see, you know, the next time you store data, it's going to be raided across Andorra, uh, uh, you know, Greenland, and Vanuatu, because there aren't extradition or data treaties with those countries, and you know, the number of people that takes to make a law is small. So so you're gonna see these things change, I think. Not data extradition countries. But data what? I no, just laughing. Non data extradition countries. Yeah, non data extradition countries. Why not? <laughs> 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 anyway, thank you all. Okay? Thank you.